Dun, dun. What's going on, everybody? Just waiting for a few more people to get in the room before we begin. And I'm also trying to pull up the chat as well. Dun, 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 dun. Man, I can't do the chat room, really? What's going on, everybody? Hang on just a second. I'm I'm trying to get to my to my chat room so I can actually see what you guys are saying. <laughs> I think this will be it right here. Yes, there it is. Opening a new window. There we go. I think I got it open. I think I'm good, boys and girls. Send me a chat message real quick, just to be sure. Someone in the room. I was actually going to wait for Eric Marks to join me today, but he's just got other stuff to do. He's always so busy. He says he's got all... There he is. Dude, I was just sitting here talking shit about you behind your back. If you're not busy, you mean you mean to call you and you can get in on this action? Bring it in, Daddy. Bring it in. Or I can I can share the the link with you. I can. What's going on, Kevin? Audio sounds good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Man, you guys are always so helpful. Just really, really helpful. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I do got several different things that I want to chit-chat today about. Dude, I can't remember your email. <laughs> That's hilarious. What's going on, Mr. Cannon? Eric Rossi. Funny Miller says, I've got you playing in the car. That's super safe. Yeah. <laughs> that Fuji guy. Yeah, you guys, you know, I still I still have Sony gear. You guys are always breaking my balls. I still own Sony gear. There's no way at this moment that I could give up my Sony gear. At all, <laughs> that that face and eye tracking for uh, for video is it's just too valuable. Still, there's no way I can give it up. But if Fuji ever gets it and fixes it, forget about it. I'm on it. Yeah, I clearly can't keep up with that on my phone. So anyway, um, Eric Rossi. Hey, Nikon Canon split right now. Canon soon, though. 60 Mark II. Yeah, I heard about uh, the new uh, 60 Mark II coming out. What's going on, Pedro? How are you, good sir? Glad to see everyone joining. Um, so what I figured we would do today is we would actually do a basically live chat about whatever the hell you all wanted to chat about. Uh, the reason that I was thinking about doing this is because I've got like so much different stuff to catch up on as far as uh, reviews on a couple of lenses, uh, review on the Peak Design backpack, the review on the Peak Design slide, the camera strap. There's also, um, I don't know, I was going to do a review too on a couple of the different apps that Eric Marks had actually uh, recommended as far as processing uncompressed or no, it was compressed raw for Fuji. Um, so I've been having like just a ton of different stuff going on, but it, finding time uh, to do all of those things, eh, it's really brutal. So Kevin says, I still want that 120 frames per second. Guys, what is the best value for a cam with 120 frames per second? I would probably say the Sony A6300 right now. Of course, it's only going to be in 1080p. 
Um, but it's a damn good camera. Best value, anyway. Uh, Eric Mark says, I saw your video on... I saw your video on, hey, uh, Eric Rossi, good stuff. I hope the 6D Mark II has better dynamic range than in the past. Yeah, um, as a matter of fact, Canon was having a few issues with their dynamic range. They've always been a bit behind Nikon when it comes to dynamic range. But uh, the thing that I really, really would like to see is Canon start releasing some cameras that actually have some 4K video. You know, call me crazy, but it's kind of a thing now. I mean... My cell phone has 4K. I mean, there's absolutely no reason for DSLRs of any caliber not to have 4K from this moment forward. <laughs> Pedro says, doing good. Hope all is well. It is. It actually really is. Kevin, 120 frames per second is really overrated, but the slow-mo does look sick. Uh, and I was going to say that if you do any kind of, like, you know, narrative video work, like wedding uh, videography or stuff like that, uh, and you put that stuff on a gimbal, all of those little extra movements are completely smoothed out. You get a whole lot more usable footage uh, when you do record in 120p, um, and especially if you release in 1080p. Um, I have yet to try any type of slow motion with my Fuji yet, though. Is that weird? But I really ha I haven't had a need yet. Um, I've not been doing any like creative video projects. It's all been photography here lately. Um, Kevin says, yes, I want the 4K too, and y'all know I'm a Canon guy so far, and thanks, Mark, for your answer. No problem. Yeah, the, um, the 4K, why they don't release anything with 4K video is just, it, it doesn't, it really doesn't make any sense. I don't know how Canon is staying in business with, uh, the way they've trickled out features. Um, you know, maybe it's just because they're a tad bit bigger than Nikon, but, I mean, with all these rumors going around, have you guys heard about this? That uh, over there in Japan, like the Minister of Finance or Industry and Business or whatever the hell they call it over there, uh, they've been begging Fuji to buy Nikon so that the company stays in Japan. Speaking of staying in Japan, I just also read an article earlier, too, that uh, Fuji was actually opening up um, a lens factory in the Philippines. It was it the Philippines? I'm thinking it was the Philippines. I got to be honest. I I really don't know if I like that or not. I like knowing that my my lenses are being built in Japan, where the work ethic is off the hook, and those those Japanese workers, man, they just have a, a certain level of pride about uh, what they create. So. Uh, I, I say that if you're interested in buying any Fuji lenses, you guys would probably ought to buy it now while it's still being made in Japan. Or the price of those Japan-made lenses are probably going to go through the roof. I don't know that to be 100% true. I don't know if it's real or not. But, uh, I mean, if I had to guess, whew. yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I hate to kind of like bash on certain countries, whatever, but when you don't really know what their work ethic is like, when you don't really know when they're, or what their, uh, you know, their skill level is as far as doing these things, I'm sure that they go through exhaustive training and they can do all the reassuring that they want, but uh, the quality control, uh, the Japanese have just, I mean, it's just on point. It's just sort of like, you know, German-made cars, you know, you got German-made cars, you got Japanese-made cameras and lenses, uh, you got, you know, they just, they have a reputation. So, uh, Eric says, yep, Philippines. Oh, see? And I don't know of anything right now that's camera related, you know, camera related, that's very good that's been coming out of the Philippines. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I really, I don't want to see that kind of stuff being made there, to be perfectly honest. I want Japanese made lenses. So, I fully intend, uh, when I start buying my, my next round of lenses, uh, they're going to be the Japanese ones. If I get any of them that say made in the Philippines, I'll just send them back and buy used. I'll buy the, the Japanese ones. So Kevin says, interesting, Mark. Wow. Yeah. I, I said the exact same thing. I, I was not really for sure if it was going to be true or not, uh, that, you know, I mean, because different companies, you know, they have 
distribution centers, they have manufacturing plants, they have a lot of different uh, links in the chain, the distribution chain all over the world. But when you're when it comes to manufacturing, when it comes to actually making, I want Japanese hands uh, on my camera gear. You know, you get used to a certain level of quality and a certain level of reliability. And when you start using just like the, the Sony APS-C lenses, a lot of those were made in like Taiwan. Um, you, you know, they're not as good. You know, they're really, really not as good. So it, it's very concerning to me, it can, especially considering I just bought into Fuji. So I do not want my lenses being made in the Philippines. No offense to any Filipinos watching. Uh, but, you know, you, you guys just don't have the reputation for making fantastic cameras or lenses. <laughs> um, Eric Mark says, well, me, you, and Rossi should go to the Philippines and check it out. Super vlog. I would do it. I would totally, I would totally go. I mean, it's a little hot this time of year. Can we wait till like November, December <laughs> when it's cooled off a little bit? Um, Eric Rossi says, so far it's been the kit lens and a few others, but not everything. Yeah, um, speaking of which, I've got my Fuji kit lens around here, and mine is made in Japan. So don't think I'm giving this one up ever. And I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you all that if, uh, if you do shoot video and you're the one behind the camera, this lens is stupid good with the optical image stabilization. I've never seen lenses as well optically stabilized as these lenses. I tried out the 50 to 140, fully zoomed in, had the optical stabilization turned on, handheld, it looked like I was on a tripod. There was none of that little, even, even micro or smoothed out hand movements at all. I mean, it was so damn good. Really, really good. So, I mean, it, it, if anyone is looking at the Fuji system for video and you're the one that plans on being behind the camera and you're going to be doing all the manual focusing and stuff, if you have uh, the chance to play around with some of their optically image stabilized lenses, I think you'll be really, really impressed. I know that I was. I still don't know if I want that lens. I'm still kind of leaning toward maybe the 55 to 200. Is that... Is that the focal range or is it 50 to 200? I don't know. I don't really like the slow um, and I don't do a whole lot of like event photography or wildlife stuff like that. So I don't know. Let's see. Kevin says, okay guys, y'all have a great afternoon. Uh, I just had a few uh, lunch minutes left to do this. Take care everyone and Mark uh, and thanks again, Mark and Eric. You're welcome, Kevin. Glad you could join us at least for a little bit, bro. It was good. It was really good to see you. <clears throat> okay, so um, the next thing I was going to talk about is I have figured out, at least here recently, that um, not all programs are equal when it comes to developing or processing the compressed RAW files in the Fuji, which is kind of a bummer. Um, because the compressed raw because the the compressed raw files that uh, the Fuji XT2 and I believe the X Pro2 uh, create are half the size, and they're un, they're they're lossless. So you know you don't have any level of image uh, degrading on those. So I would have really liked to have saved the space, but I did manage to find two apps, Eric. Good seeing you, man. Peace. Be, be good. Maybe we'll talk later. Oh, Boogernator, you and your Fuji plus Nikon equals love. P mode. Okay, let me let, let me answer that in just a second. Um, but the, um, the the compressed raw files that the Fuji XT2 creates, it, it's actually a lossless. It's a lossless file. So you don't lose any of your image quality. You don't lose, it, it doesn't clip anything. It doesn't cut anything off. And it's half the size of the uncompressed raw. But there's only two apps, there's only two programs that I know of right now that can actually process them. Um, and that is Pictorial, and the other one is the On One Raw Developer. Uh, I'm not for sure about the Iridian uh, developer. Maybe if someone else has used that, they can let me know. But um, 
I am not hugely impressed with any of these apps. I think some of them are pretty good. I think some of them are all right. Some of them are really fantastic, but none of them are just like wowing me to like an extremely high extent. Um, but you know, I guess that's what you get. I mean, the, the Lightroom will still process them just fine. Um, again, I just hate Adobe software. I, I, I don't like the pay to play model. Um, but yeah, so if you guys are wanting to shoot in the compressor all, the two that I have found that will actually open those files up are Pictorial and On One Raw Developer. Those are the only two. Like I said, maybe Iridian does, so if you've already got it and you guys can let me know, that'd be awesome. Uh, Captain P Mode says, how is P Mode on the, or, or with the X-T2? Uh, pretty damn good. I mean, I, I use it on occasion. If I'm not really for sure what my settings ought to be, if it's in like a really weird sort of uh, lighting setup, I just turn everything to A and then put the uh, auto aperture on my lens, turn that on, and I mean, it works fantastic. And Fuji's metering system, uh, if you're wondering, is probably one of the better ones that I've seen. Um, even the white balance to the auto white balance in the camera is probably one of the better ones I've seen. It really is not uh, that far off from accurate. It's probably one of the better ones that I've ever seen, to be perfectly honest. So uh, that's the reason I keep saying that if you are a still shooter, if you love to shoot stills, uh, you should try this for yourself. Um, I don't have to sell this camera. I don't have to like talk really good about it or anything. Um, it just really works fantastically. I, I'm surprised every single time, even in auto mode, uh, when I'm just kind of casually shooting around, flip everything over, set everything to auto white balance, auto ISO, everything, I still just get fantastic results. The metering system is really good. I generally keep my metering mode turned on uh, like the, the wide. I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not. I usually keep it on the... Shit. I can usually keep it on that one, not the full frame one, which is this one, but the second one. And usually that one does really, really good. Uh, I still use the spot metering or the center weighted uh, when necessary. If I'm, you know, if I have a really weird lighting situation uh, and I really, I'm just, I'm wanting to focus on say one little patch uh, and get that thing correctly exposed. But overall the, um, the wide, works really fantastic. Uh, Norma G says the camera speaks for itself. It really does. And uh, I know that a lot of people will be going, oh man, you, you're, you're switching again. Uh, no, I still have my Sony gear. I still need my Sony gear because the the, the face and eye uh, tracking autofocus setup, way better than the Fuji's. Uh, I'll just, I'll be 100% honest. Um, while it's decent, it's just not anywhere close to what Sony's is. And I think that is the biggest uh, hurdle for a lot of video shooters that have picked up Sony at some point. It's just really, really hard to beat the face and eye tracking on the Sony cameras. So, uh, and that's that's my biggest hang up. If, if it wasn't for that, I probably, yeah, I would have. I probably would have sold all my Sony stuff, but um, the cameras themselves, the tech that's built in, into the cameras are just really good. So, I mean, and like I said, there's only a couple of things. There's only a couple of reasons to keep my Sony a6300. Uh, a6, uh, so if Fuji ever does at some point improve their autofocusing tech, I, I, I probably will sell it. So I might uh, be giving someone a discount. That's that's if anyone is interested. <laughs> Captain Pimo says, what film profiles uh, do you like for black and white and color? For color, I really like the um, classic chrome. Classic chrome, or I like the negative, uh, the pro negative. I think it's the high. I'm pretty sure. Let me just double check. Nope, it's the pro negative standard. I really like that one, the pro negative standard. And what I do is when I go into pro negative standard, I uh, hop into the quick menu and I turn the uh, highlight tones all the way down, I turn the shadow tones all the way down, uh, and I turn the sharpness all the way down. 
and that gives me as flat of a profile as I want. If I don't want to grade, I like classic Chrome. Uh, and as far as uh, Acros, black and white, love it. Black and white is Acros all the way. Nine times out of 10, I will just shoot raw or in standard JPEG and usually get the best results. So, uh, so far, all of my black and white photography since I've been shooting on the Fuji, I, I'm at, I'm even now more in love with black and white than I ever was before. So I don't I don't know if that's a strong testimonial coming for me or not, but it's it's over and above what I was expecting, uh, and it's over and above what I was hoping for as well. So you know I went into it thinking it's going to be decent. And it ended up being, you know, and then I thought, oh, well, this is pretty good. And then I've started using it more and more, and now it's exceeding my expectations every time I use it. So um, I really hate that I don't like color as much as most other people do because I, I wish I could give, like, a better um, testimonial for the color profiles. But I, I, I honestly, I just don't use them that much. Now, if I'm shooting in video, like I said, it's pro negative. Um, it's on the, uh, the standard and it's pretty good. I mean, it helps open those shadows up a little bit, uh, and it does it relatively well. I mean, it's about as much dynamic range as you would want without having to do a lot of color grading. So if you didn't want to actually change the overall color tone uh, of your video, I think color, uh, or, you know, the pro negative standard or the classic Chrome are two ex exceptionally good semi-flat picture profiles that you can get with your video. So... Uh, Norm G says, I shoot Sony, but the X-T2 is the next best thing. Um, yeah, I, I think it kind of depends on what Sony you're using, though, um, and why you're shooting Sony. So, it, you know, if you're shooting Sony because of video, yeah, I 100% agree. Let's see. Captain P. Mode says, you ever heard of Kevin Mullins? He's a wedding photographer, and, uh, a f and he shoots Fuji in a lot of black and white. I have not ever heard of him. Um... You should leave his link or something in the chat. I'll go check him out. Harold Harder says, you expect Sony to launch the uh, RX10 Mark IV? I want to buy the Mark III, or is it better to wait? Um, to be perfectly uh, frank with you, Harold, the, R the RX10 Mark II is fantastic because it's got the built-in ND filters. The RX10 Mark III is fantastic because of that insanely long reach. Um, I don't know about the Mark IV. I'm assuming that they'll probably improve some of the features uh, on the uh, photography side a little bit. They're awfully big cameras to be, uh, to be housing such a small sensor, but they are phenomenal video cameras because of the small sensor size. You don't get the rolling shutter that you get with some of these bigger sensor DSLRs. So that's a that's a good thing. And I've used both the Mark II and the Mark III, and I loved them both. I didn't buy them because they're really not targeted for me. Um, but if I was doing more like event videos, uh, if I was doing more news gathering, ENG uh, type stuff, I would probably get the Mark III but just because I got that extra reach. And even with clear image zoom uh, at like, what is it, 600 millimeters or something, the image still looks fantastic. It really does. Uh, I did a review on the uh, RX-10 Mark III on my channel, so if you want to look that up, you can. Um, very beefy, very stout cameras. They feel extremely solid. Bigger than any DSLR uh, that... Bigger than most DSLRs in, like, entry level. So your D7200s, your D7300s, your 5200s, what Nikon's, the Canon 60, they're all, it's all roughly about that size, maybe a little bit bigger, uh, especially because it's got the built-in lens. I mean, the lens barrel on that thing is like this big, so I mean, it's just, it's massive. Um, Captain Pimo says, kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk. Okay, so a fellow Brit, speaking of fellow Brits, um, Dunny Monster told me, he said, yeah, man, he said, yeah, all those pictures that you put up in your uh, Fuji X-T2 review, he said, none of them were duffers. I had no clue what a duffer was, but apparently it's uh, like a shitty photograph, so I didn't have any duffers. That's a, that's a, that's a no good, that's a no good photograph, so it's a duffer. 
So I learned something new. <laughs> um, by the way, I also want to tell you guys that I am oh, loving my Peak Design backpack. It's heavy as a heavy as a bitch, but it is extremely functional. Um, it's 500D Cordura fabric that has been wax coated. This thing is going to last literally forever. Um, I go hiking. I go camping in the back country, extremely, you know, unrefined situations. And I don't even use fabric that tough. I sleep in a hammock that has paper thin fabric and it holds my body weight just fine. I'm used to ultralight backpacking. My backpack weighs 17 ounces when I go hiking. Like that's how much my backpack weighs. This backpack weighs, I think right around four pounds. So it's a heavy son of a bitch, but it's, I mean, it's durable as hell. I guess if you were chucking this thing around at airports and, and throwing it into carry-on compartments and stuff like that, maybe you'd want it to be a little extra stout, but I, I just don't know that it needs to be that stout. Uh, Captain Pimo says, do you miss anything from full frame like bokeh and compression? Not as much as I thought I would. Um, I was actually, when I first made the switch uh, from full frame over to APS-C, I probably shot for about five years solid with Nikon full frame. Um, and I, I loved it. I, I generally thought that most of my images were pretty good. The clients usually liked the work that I, I produced on them. I was just so tired of the size uh, of the glass, the, the heft of the glass. Um, the cameras were just massively huge. Um, and when I first found the Sony a6300 in the photographs, um, were for the most part, I mean, 95% of what I was getting with the, uh, the Nikon cameras I could get with the Sony a6300 or the a6000, uh, very sharp images, depending on the lenses that I used. I mean, I ended up having to use the 518 a lot for my, uh, portrait work. Uh, I had to use the, uh, 18 to 105 a lot for my video work. Um, but the video quality was far and above what Nikon was producing back then. You know, I think, I think I had one of their crop sensor bodies. Uh, I think it was the Nikon D7000 at the time. Uh, the 1080p video on that was just absolute trash. I mean, you could re you could try and make it work um, out in good daylight scenarios, but other than that, it was just crap. I hated it. And then when I got that Sony, I mean, I was just like, this, this can't even be for real. I'm getting this good of video quality in this size camera body. Um, and as far as like my full frame camera, the Nikon D610, uh, um, I used it for a while. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, the D810 was fantastic, but they're all extremely heavy. Um, some people really, really get fine wine when it comes to their bokeh. They really get hyper technical about exactly how much compression and how much bokeh did they get in each of those shots, depending on the lens. Uh, the, the photo sites, uh, this, that, and the other. And, you know, I don't do that. I'm a very aesthetic shooter. I'm not an overly technical shooter. So a lot of people, when they say, you know, you know, how did you think about the ratios of this, that, to the other? And I'm just like, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. So, uh, you know, I go a lot on how I feel and what I know I can get out of the camera and lenses that I'm using. Um, I, I want to make it perfectly clear too, and I think that I've, there's been a lot of misconceptions about just exactly why I switched, not not switched, why I picked up the, the Fuji system. It really didn't have anything to do with the cameras themselves that Sony was making. I like uh, the size, weight um, of Sony's cameras. It's the glass. I want to shoot APS-C. That's what I want to shoot. And Sony's APS-C glass, while decent, while it's all right, you know, they don't have any fast zooms yet. They still, to this day, do not have, they've got the, the Zeiss 16 to 70, but it's at an F4. Um, they've got the 18 to 105. It's an F4. Uh, they've got the 55 to 210, uh, which is a variable aperture. I think it's 4.5 to 6.3 or something like that. I mean, they, they just didn't have any fast zooms. Um, 
they had one macro lens. Their 16 millimeter was crap. Uh, Fuji 16 millimeter is just unbelievable. Yes, it's bigger. Yes, it's heavier. Uh, but it's all metal construction. It's made in Japan. Um, it's just a fantastic lens. Uh, so the 16 millimeter pancake, I think they kind of knew it was a piece of a piece of crap, and <laughs> that's the reason they had to re-release it. And apparently, the you know the the mechanics of making that lens, you know, it just wasn't very good for them. I guess in that focal length, hence the reason they came out with the the 20 millimeter, which. In all fairness, the 20 millimeter was far and away, head and shoulders better than the 16 millimeter lens was. So, uh, Captain P Mode also says, I shoot weddings with uh, micro four thirds and my boss is full frame and clients never said my photos don't look as good as my boss's photos. Do you know why? Because clients don't know the difference between micro four thirds and a micro pecker. You know, like they, they have no idea. They literally have no clue. Clients are not the ones who are going to uh, break your balls. You know, it's only going to be other photographers. Uh, they, they are, we are our own worst enemies. So, you know, I've never had a single person that I've ever shot photos for, whether it be, you know, portraits or whether it be bourgeois or whether it be for a wedding or whatever. They, they never came back and, Mark, uh, I wanted to talk to you about your, you know, your depth of field. It doesn't seem to be, you know, no one's ever said anything like that because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. All they know is, do I look sexy? Okay, let's start moving on to the next one. <laughs> Uh, Nor uh, Norma G says, 19 millimeter uh, f2.8 Sigma Sony mount is awesome and so cheap. Yes, I own that lens. That was one of the two lenses that I kept for my Sony uh, system. Like I said, I do a lot of video and I do a lot of self video uh, for my channel. And the 19 millimeter is probably one of the best YouTube lenses. The 20 millimeter uh, on the Sony is okay. But realistically, it's about at least double the price, you know? So you get a, a slight bit wider uh, with the 19 millimeter from Sigma. And honestly, I think the image is way, way sharper. So uh, I kept the, the cheaper Sigma uh, 19 millimeter F2.8. Uh, did not keep the 20 millimeter from Sony. The... 30 millimeter f1.4 from Sigma was the other lens that I kept. I think that, that lens is fantastic for video, even though it's not optically stabilized. Uh, you know, if you're going to throw it on a gimbal, it doesn't really matter anyway. So, uh, and the autofocusing is just about as good on the uh, the Sigma 30 millimeter f1.4 as it is on most native lenses. So, you know, if I was going to compare it to say like the Sony 35 millimeter f1.8. I get an extra stop of light, but I lose the optical image stabilization. But if I'm doing video, I'm probably going to be having it on a gimbal anyhow. So it kind of negates it. So I get sharper and faster glass with the Sigma. And, you know, the optical image stabilization is handled, you know, with, uh, with the gimbal anyway, which works on not just one lens, but multiple lenses, any lens, any film lens that I want to adapt. Um, I've got stabilization. No big deal. So... <laughs> Uh, Dunny Monster in a his ass. What's up, Daddy? Yeah, I was just talking about you a second ago. How I uh, I learned a new word from you. <laughs> uh, what was it? Uh, none of them were duffers. I think that that's what you you called them. Was it duffers? Norma G says uh, good for both stills or video. I agree. They're they're both good. Like I said, I like wide angle uh, lenses. I'm actually a huge fan of wide angle lenses. I, uh, I find myself shooting on wide angle lenses more than I do say like medium focal length lenses. Uh, I find myself shooting less and less with the 35s, the 50s, and I find myself enjoying more of the 16s, 24s. You know, I find myself shooting with those quite a bit, especially with the Fuji 16. That was probably the biggest reason why I decided to get the Fuji. Uh, was because it's a 16 on the X-T2, which is a 24 millimeter, uh, 24 equivalent on a full frame. Um, but I also get really close focusing. So if I need to do some product photography, 
me if I need to get detail shots of something that I'm going to be uh, reviewing on my channel. That lens is not only sharp as hell, but fast. Um, made in Japan. The optics and rendering are fantastic, uh, but the hyperfocal distance is only about 10 meters or so. So, I mean, you just shoot just right out there, and your whole scene is going to be perfectly in focus. I mean, it really is. Is If you do any kind of, like, cityscapes or, you know, really tall buildings and architecture like I've been doing, uh, you're going to have absolutely no problem with the 60 millimeter. It's just so goddamn good. So much better. I mean, it's almost embarrassing for, for us to try and take that little silver pancake lens from Sony and compare it to that amazing build quality of the 16 millimeter Fuji. It's embarrassing. And Sony should be ashamed of themselves. That's like the redheaded, no, no offense to redheads, by the way, that's like the redheaded stepchild of, of the, the whole lens line. Like, like, they should be ashamed of themselves for ever putting that on the market. Um, I got it. <laughs> I bought that lens just so that I could put the fisheye adapter on it. And my copy was one of the copies that was really bad. It looked like it had like Vaseline and shit all over the lens. And then you put the, the fisheye on there and then it just exacerbated it. It was really bad. If anyone's ever used that lens, come on. Uh, let's see. Norma G says, awesome lens, the 30 uh, to uh, f1.4. Yes, it is. And for the price, uh, especially if you can catch it on sale or maybe uh, scoop it up used or something, for 350 bucks, roughly, you know, what it costs for retail, it's an absolutely stellar lens. Absolutely phenomenal lens. And sharp as hell. Anyone that does, I don't know, uh, I'm going to say like product photography. You know, you got to get you got to stand a little, little bit further back for some pro, you know, product photography so that, you know, you don't get a shadow or anything uh, on the product. That lens is off the hook. It, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's beautiful. So, uh, you, you know, you've got the 30 millimeter, which all, is almost a 50. And the only one that's even close uh, to comparable in my, in my opinion, uh, is the 518 in terms of sharpness, um, as far as Sony's lens lineup goes. So, some people might argue maybe like the Zeiss to it or something might be up there. But uh, if you want the absolute sharpest lens uh, that you can buy for the APS-C line of cameras uh, that Sony creates, it would be the Sigma 30 millimeter F1.4. Uh, Captain Pimo says, would you go micro four thirds for Panasonic pro zooms uh, that are lightweight? Me personally, I, probably not. I mean, I've tried out Panasonic systems. I've tried out, I think, four of their cameras and probably a half dozen of their lenses. While I love the weight, especially the G7, uh, the G7 is just a, a ridiculously light camera. They're 12, what is it, the 12 to 42, I think it is, or 46, or I can't remember what the focal length was of that lens, but um, all of that stuff was really great. I mean, as far as like image quality and stuff like that, um, but I settled on Fuji. I settled on another APS-C camera. And I got to be honest with you. Um, I do think that Panasonic is kind of overpricing some of their, uh, their zoom lenses, to be perfectly honest. I, d I don't think that Panasonic's lenses for that size, I mean, it's, it's for the price that they're charging for some of their lenses, you could have an APS-C camera, which would give you better bokeh and better compression. Uh, more so than the the difference between APS-C and full frame. So, but that's just my opinion, man. Norma G says, you talk a lot of sense. Like and subscribe. Well, thank you. I thought you had already subscribed for some reason, but I appreciate it. Captain Pimo says, the Fuji 27mm f2.8 is a fun street lens. I haven't picked up that one yet. As a matter of fact, I haven't even tried it yet. I think I may have seen a couple of reviews on it, but I, I'm not overly interested in that focal range for one reason. Um, I've been contemplating getting the 10 to 24 Fuji, or I've been really thinking about waiting for that new super wide angle. I think it's going to be an 8 to 16 millimeter, which would cover that range for me. Uh, because I do plan on getting the 16 to 55 uh, 
millimeter. So I'm, I, I am going to get the Holy Trinity of Fuji lenses. Um, but I really don't need it right this second. Perfectly, perfectly happy with what I have right now. Um, if anything, I'm actually going to get the smaller F2 primes first um, because I do prefer prime lenses over um, over the zooms. The only reason why people uh, in general, photographers in general, get zooms is when they do not have time to constantly be swapping their lenses based on actions. When, when you're doing event photography or wedding photography, you don't have time to be swapping your lenses all the time. It just makes more sense to carry a bag with two or three zooms and that's it. You, you, there's no way to keep up with all that. But if, you know, if you're more of a studio shooter like I am or a street photographer, um, you know, two or three little primes that basically cover all the ranges. Um, I gotta be honest, the 18 to 55, the kit lens is, is so good for just walking around and it is the best, uh, kit lens of any system out there. Okay. I've tried a lot of different cameras with a lot of different bundled lenses with the, the new camera bodies and none are nearly as good as this. I mean, it's a variable aperture, but it starts off at 2.8. It only goes up to F4. It has optical image stabilization built in. It's all metal construction. And it's made in Japan. I don't know if I need to say much else. <laughs> um, Dunny Monster says, I've got to stop listening to all this Fujifilm talk. It's making me envious. Yeah, dude, I told you. I mean, I know you're not gonna, I know you're not gonna do anything about it. I mean, I, you know, I'll give you that itch. I, I will. I'll, I'll encourage the itch, but I know you're not going to do anything about it. You might. But, I, but if you do, make sure you attribute, attribute me. You Tell everyone that I was the little devil in your ear. <laughs> uh, Harold says, thanks, you're welcome. Um, and Norma G says, I've signed up just now. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm honestly uh, quite humbled by the influx of new subscribers to my channel here lately. I really do appreciate it. I don't think that you guys really, really understand how much um, YouTubers in general try to get uh, to know their audience. It's, um, it is extremely difficult to grow a channel. And uh, I feel sorry for a lot of the new YouTubers that are just now coming up in the scene because it is so difficult to garner the attention of anybody with everyone making videos on every single topic under the sun for, for people to, to actually get, you know, some level of attention on YouTube these days. I mean, it is extremely difficult. So I, I, I mean, I, I'm just thankful that I started years and years ago and it wasn't like last week. It would be so disheartening because even with, you know, my level of uh, channel success, it's, it still gets in, I get, I get discouraged all the time. I mean, I get really, really down uh, all the time. <laughs> I mean, it is just, when, when you get some tween with, you know, braces and they're putting emojis and stuff all over their screen and just, hey, I, I just want to let everyone know that I have Panera Bread today. And then I took a shit and it was super duper cool. Uh, and they get a hundred thousand views per video. I just, I really do. I want to, I just want to kill myself. So not really. Don't call fucking suicide prevention. It's just a joke. Um, Norma G says, I've heard that the kit lens is superb, but not like the uh, Sony poor kit lens. See, I'll agree. The, the level of quality on the Fuji uh, kit lens is fantastic. Phenomenal. Stellar. That's what I would describe this kit lens. I never really had any huge problems with Sony's kit lens for its size and weight and its price at only about 150 bucks. This kit lens by itself is $700. So it ought to be damn good. Uh, but yeah, for like 150 bucks, the, the, the 16 to 50 uh, Sony kit lens, I thought was great. I really, I never had any problems with it. I use it as my everyday walk around lens all the time. Um, uh, I got some fantastic shots with that lens. So it's really, really hard for me to, to, to bash on Sony's kit lens. 
And I made uh, a video probably like two years ago uh, defending uh, the Sony kit lens. It's probably one of my most watched Sony videos. It was basically a rant where I was kind of taking aim at other photographers who wanted to talk down to other younger photographers and make them feel bad about having less expensive gear. Um, yeah, I don't like that at all. You know, I, I don't like other photographers uh, bashing, you know, the young guys or making them feel like shit or making them feel like that they're not good enough uh, or that they suck because they don't have, you know, $5,000 rig in their hands, you know, to take, you know, you know, they just started and you want them to have $5,000 worth of gear in their hands. You know, it just, it, it's really, it's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> Uh, Captain Pimo says the Panasonic lens uh, lenses that are lightweight uh, are the 12 to 35 f 2.8, the 35 to 100 f 2.8. Uh, these two lenses are so light they feel like an f 250. The Fuji 18 to 55 might be my next lens for Fuji. Yeah, I mean for the price you can pick them up used all day long for probably like 300 and a quarter. Um, there's honestly there's really no reason not to. I mean at that price point, holy shit, just buy it. Uh, Dunny Monster says, you give me the itch, but I can't reach to scratch it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it's probably because, you know, when you start getting gas, when you start getting gear acquisition syndrome, you, you just, you spend too much damn money, you know, and then you just, then you got to relax for a while. You got to go, oh God, I got to get myself out of debt. Um, so yeah, I, I, I spent... Uh, roughly about four thousand dollars here in just the last few days uh, well the last week or so um, so and I've got to get all that paid off you know uh, in about two weeks so I, I don't I don't keep debt very long I usually try and get it paid off relatively quickly so uh, by the way like I said I was talking to you uh, talking about you earlier Dunny when you said that none of my photographs in my XT2 review video you said none of them were duffers and I interpreted a duffer to mean that it wasn't a piece of shit. Am I right? Because if that's true, I'm going to start using that word. Dude, you're a duffer. You're a piece of duffer. Just so just let me know. Um, Captain Pimo says, I use Panasonic lens on Olympus cameras. Yeah, I mean, that's the great, that is one of the good things about either using Panasonic or Olympus. You've got access to both systems lenses, completely interchangeable, which is awesome. <laughs> um, Norma G says, these live shows are really good. Love them. Do you really? That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I haven't really um, understood why, why people do, uh, why people watch live streams, but you all do. Like, I, I get so many views on some of these live streams, and I, ha I have no idea why you watch them. <laughs> uh, so I just keep making them because you guys keep watching them. Uh, Norma G says, uh, to be honest, the Sony kit is not that bad. Just wish it was a little better. That's all. Yeah. I mean, anything could be better. And I've, I've, I've gotten to the point now where I've kind of learned that, you know, uh, you know, even as much as I love the Fuji XC2, I mean, this is just an absolutely gorgeous, well-built camera, but even it could be better. You know, there are a couple of things that I don't like about this camera. Um, not much, but there are a couple of things. And, you know, the longer you uh, are, as long as you are honest with yourself, at least you'll be able to work around those problems, those issues. Um, so, what, like I said, I don't have many issues with this camera. It's probably one of the most usable cameras that I have ever used, ever. So, and that's saying a lot, because I've used all, I mean, a lot of cameras. I've, oh my God. Not even, not even counting the ones that I, I get in for review all the time, um, but I'm, I'm talking about like, I used to shoot some Canons. I used to shoot Minolta film cameras. I used to shoot pinhole cameras. I used to shoot shoebox cameras. I used to shoot old Polaroid cameras, uh, Nikon, Sony, and now I'm a full-fledged uh, Fuji user. So, not a full-fledged, because I still own Sony gear, but anyway. C-Web at 1988, phew, $4,000, dang. I know, that's what I say every time I have to spend a bunch of money. And look, and then $300 on a, back, $300 on a backpack, 
Uh, I think I spent about a hundred dollars in new Peak Design straps. Um, had to get the battery charger for the, the the Fuji batteries, so that was another you know twenty six bucks or something. Um, yeah, I mean shit just adds up, man. It's just you know you get something new and then you got to accessorize. So that's exactly what I had to do. I had to accessorize. Uh, Captain Pimo says, uh, "How are the Sony uh, JPEGs versus uh, Fuji JPEGs? And are you going to make a video about Sony?" J yeah, as a matter of fact, I already started that video, and I was uh, trying to get some samples. Uh, it is just ridiculously hard to juggle all the different videos that I've been trying to work on here lately. So let me just tell you this: if you want to shoot JPEGs and know that they are going to be off the chain good right out of camera, it's Fuji all day long. I'll just I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, I'll still make the video just so that I have some extra content on the channel, but I'm telling you right now, if it's if it's JPEG quality that you're interested in, it's Fuji all day long, all day. Uh, I would not ever, I mean ever, ever, ever shoot an event uh, where I was getting paid JPEG on a Sony camera, period, end of story. They, they, they have too many color problems uh, in certain lighting conditions, especially for fluorescent light. It just plays absolute hell with Sony cameras. So, I mean, you should always shoot in RAW. You should always shoot in custom white balance as much as humanly possible. Um, even set a custom white balance, you know, before each situation. If you walk into another room uh, with a Sony and you're not for sure what kind of bulbs they are, do a custom white balance. Yeah, but if you want just absolute... Unbelievable. The, the, only, the only time that I would be concerned with the JPEGs in the Fuji is if uh, I was, if for whatever reason I was using the electronic shutter uh, with some sort of fluorescent, not fluorescent, LED lights, anything where you might get your flicker or your banding. Uh, that would be the only time, but I can, I, I've got it set up, uh, the Fuji X2, I've got it set up so that I can just hit uh, the menu and it goes to my custom menu and I can easily swap from. Uh, electronic shutter and mechanical shutter to just one or the other on the fly. So if I'm going indoors, I just I just skip it and go right to mechanical shutter. If I'm going back outside, I'll I'll use the electronic and mechanical shutter because if I want to shoot something that's just extremely bright, having an electronic shutter that does one thirty two thousandths of a second is just you you guys have no idea how good that is. Oh, it's so good. Um. <laughs> Norgy says uh, it's a good place to chat and get to know you and vice versa like real life you know yeah that's what I think that's the reason I like doing it <laughs> Franklin Tata says current relaxing from gas me too I am relaxing man I had to take a break from my gas because you know you go on a little bit of a binger not to mention I ended up having to buy the brand new of course, I had to uh, the the brand new June Crane version two, and I just bought that uh, nine bot Segway Mini Pro so I could zip around town. So there's another, you know, eleven hundred dollars, twelve hundred dollars for those two items. So I mean, I have just so that's like five thousand, six thousand dollars in just the last couple of just in the last few weeks. It's bad, ain't it? <laughs> but you know. It's only money. You can make more of it. Uh, Dunny Monster says, spot on, Mark. A duffer is basically a piece of crap. <laughs> That's why the beer on The Simpsons is called Duff Beer, because it tastes like shit. All right. So I didn't know that. I just say shit. It tastes like shit, dude. So, yeah, I'm going to start using duffer when I, have to, when I have to act right. If I'm around my mother and I don't want to say curse words, I'm just going to say, Mom... I just can't handle this duffer anymore. C-Web1988 says, shoot cannons. Ha! Get it? Get it? <laughs> oh, you're a special kid. <laughs> Frank Lutetta says, uh, I'm at work, and that's why I laugh my ass off. Yeah, yeah. Um, Norma G says, Mark, it was a pleasure chatting. You need to go take care of Norma. I appreciate you hanging out. It was a pleasure speaking with you this afternoon as well. You have a fantastic day. Fantastic day. 
Captain Pimo says, uh, the only bad things uh, about uh, all mirrorless cameras is the purple flare, but a polarizer or ND filter will fix that. DSLR doesn't have this problem. Uh, the lens is about an inch away from the sensor. You know, I, I haven't had much, though, to be perfectly honest. Purple flare, generally, I, I may have had it, I don't know, a handful of times, but... I, I do a lot of studio work. I do a lot of stuff that's just indoors where I'm controlling all the light. So it's not really been a huge issue for me. Um, I don't know if the uh, nano GI coatings or the super uh, EVC coatings on the Fuji lenses have any effect, but I have noticed no purple uh, flaring whatsoever, at least not yet. So it might be a thing. Um, I don't know. But up until this point, I haven't experienced any. Thank God. Um, Captain Pimo says, and the black and white uh, or the black walls stop the light bouncing around. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you, you do get, a, I'm not going to say, and a lot of people still confuse the fact that just because I want to shoot mirrorless that I don't like DSLRs. DSLRs have a place. They, they have a purpose. So you have to know yourself and you have to know the type of environments you're going to be shooting in you have to know what you plan on shooting and buy the right tool for the right job otherwise you know you, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how else to explain it but i mean you know you're not buying a chainsaw to hammer a nail you know or you, you don't buy a shovel to to drill a screw hole you know you don't you you get what you need not what you like if you have the extra cash you get both, like me. See, I need the Sony for video because I like that face tracking. But I want a Fuji because it takes just fantastic images. So, um, Captain Pimo says, it's a problem for wedding photographers that shoot uh, a lot of backlighting. It, it is, but I have said this before. I am one of those uh, kinds of photographers that I actually, I enjoy the happy accidents. Um, if, if I was doing that and I was doing it on purpose, you know, if I was intentionally trying to get the lens to flare, I mean, if I'm going to shoot, you know, the, the couple backlit or whatever, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it would be that big of a deal for me. I mean, unless it just, it, unless it was like right across their face or something like that. But, you know, if you get a little bit of flaring, a little bit of purple flare in there with the, the circular, uh, yeah, I don't... I, not to mention high speed sync usually takes care of that quite a bit too. Um, because you, I don't know. I, I, I like the flares. I really do. I, I, at least if, if it's, if it's on purposely backlit, if I'm doing the flaring myself, then I have no, now, of course, when you're not expecting it or when you don't want it to show up, in the, of course, that's when it's going to happen. Right. Um, or when you're controlling the light, it never happens. Um, but yeah, when you're when you're doing the flaring, I, I actually like lenses that flare. Um, that's the reason I, I buy a lot of this old film glass that doesn't have any kind of coatings on it. Um, there's a very organic and natural feel to those types of lenses. Those uh, those flares and stuff that come out in those film lenses, and they're dirt cheap too. So, you know, I, I don't know what it is with our current state of photography where everyone is just. They want just maximum sharpness, maximum resolution, uh, maximum uh, micro contrast. They're, they're obsessing over the photo sites and just, it's just, photography is not supposed to be that goddamn technical. It's, it's really not. It's a, it's an art form. Um, it is a, it is a form of expression. And if if you're that obsessed, and this is just all my opinion, I mean, and you can disagree with me if you want to. I mean, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Um, but if you obsess so much with the numbers, the details, the specs, the technicals, you know, the, I mean, what happened to the fun? You know, are you even having any fun at that point when you're going, oh my God, I need to do the calculations and the thing. It's just like, if you're a photographer, just shoot. You know, do some small lighting modifications, adjust your composition a little bit, and take some shots. 
You know, if I overcomplicated my photography that much, I, I'd probably never shoot shit. Sometimes you just, you got to get in there and you just got to shoot. Uh, be a photographer. Take a shot. Um, that's what I've been doing a lot here with this Fuji. Like, I have not worried about the technical aspects at all. I, I have so much confidence in what this camera is capable of. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm fully confident in my own technical skill as far as lighting and composition and stuff goes. Um, I, I've just been having fun again. I've actually been having fun again. And, you know, I, I, so many people come to my channel, um, and I'm sure that they do it to a lot of other people too. It's just always about the specs. What's the frames per second? A lot. Are you ever going to use them? Probably not. What do you care? Um, you know, is it going to, does it have S log? Yeah, it does have S log. S log three even. Are you going to use it? Probably not. At least not much. You know, so people get obsessed over these, these things. And I guarantee you nine times out of 10 shit just sits in the closet. They never go out and shoot. They never do anything with it. Especially just the, just the, the amateurs and the, the hobbyists, the light hobbyists. Why they obsess over settings at all is beyond me. It's just like you are wasting your money. So it's a complete waste of money to buy that much tech when you don't even understand how to use it. I mean, the, you, you could literally buy $200 uh, point and shoots that would service the vast majority of the people that watch these videos um, perfectly fine. There, there's literally about a 5% of the photography community that actually needs most of these brand new cameras. So, but no one wants to, you know, no one wants to drive the hoopty, you know, when everyone else has the best. So, I mean, it is very much a consumerism style rat race, unfortunately. Um, Franklin Tata says, do you have any experience with the X-Pro2? If so, thoughts on the differences with the viewfinders? I do not have any experience uh, personally with the X-Pro2. I'm not a huge rangefinder type of shooter. Uh, I know what a rangefinder's benefits are. I've shot with old rangefinders, just not the X-Pro2. Um, I like being able to see outside my frame of view to help compose with certain shots, especially uh, shots in motion. So if you are... Uh, a street photographer or if you do a lot of moving subjects, uh, a rangefinder is fantastic for those types of things. I'm not all, also I'm not a huge fa uh, fan of the form factor. It's just personal preference though. Um, that's the reason a lot of photographers shoot with both eyes open, kind of like when you shoot a rifle. Um, but I'm left eye dominant. So, you know, it's up to this eye. And when I've got my eye closed, you know, or even if I had my eye open, I can't see over the dials anyway. So, <sighs> oh, hey, um, Sam Purcell says, "Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing really good, thank you." Uh, CWeb1988 says, "As a graphic designer, that's why I really like resolution. It means there's just more available for editing." I agree, um, and I say always shoot in the highest resolution possible, so that you know you can just shoot, and if you do. In fact, have to make a few adjustments. If you've got to crop in a little bit here or there, fine. If you've got to do a little bit of maybe auto white balance because, you know, the metering system got a little jacked up or something, fine. But, I mean, if you literally have to go in and completely change everything about your photograph because it was completely horrendous to begin with as it was shot, you're not a photographer. You're a graphic designer. You know, you're a, you're a digital artist. You're not a photographer. You know, you captured the data, yes, but if your composition and your lighting sucked and you've literally got to repair everything with Photoshop, you know, those are two completely different professions. So, um, I'm a photographer. I like to try and get it right in camera. I don't want to fix a bunch of shit after the fact. Again, personal preference. I'm not bagging on anyone who does Photoshop. Maybe it's just something you like to do. I don't know. Anyway... <laughs> I'm getting into dangerous territory when I start pissing in people's weedies. Uh, Ultra Muck says, absolutely right, Mr. Puckett. I love it when people tell me I'm right, gosh darn it. Uh, Captain Pimo says, some photographers might not have a problem with the purple flare, but some photographers work <coughs> um, with uh, backlighting, trying to get the golden hour and uh, just want the yellow gold. Uh, but I know what you're saying. Yeah, and I agree. You know, like I said, if if you can control it, if, if it's a, 
if it's an artistic choice, then sure, you know. Um, it, it, yeah, if people are just wanting that golden hour in every single flare and every single ray uh, that's coming back toward the camera, if they just want it to be that hue of white and gold, then yeah, I completely understand. Uh, Dunny Monster says, uh, DSLR eyepieces were designed by a Cyclops. <laughs> You're probably not wrong, man. You're probably not. Um, but yeah, so if, if, you know, kind of expanding on what I was saying earlier, though, uh, as far as like the difference between just going out there and shooting and having some fun and, and obsessing over the, the stats of the camera. They, why do you think that professional photographers, when, when they go out and they, they go and shoot, they look for tiny, small cameras? Uh, they want small, itsy-bitsy little, you know, just try, because <clears throat> they are confident in their skills as a photographer to wait for the right lighting or to adjust the lighting as they need it uh, and to get good composition. Other than that, I mean, you don't need much else. So it, up here. Fill your brain with what you need rather than your camera bag with a bunch of shit that you probably need but don't know how to use. Don't waste your money. Not being a dick, just being honest. <coughs> Excuse me. Captain P Mode says, just want to add the photographers I know that don't want purple flare to the same wedding photographer that's shooting cloudy white balance. Um, they want a warm tone to all their photos. It's true. Of the handful of weddings that I've ever done, I, I hate weddings. Um, I've never billed myself as a wedding photographer, but I have had some friends um, that wanted me to do some weddings for them. And I'm not a bad wedding photographer. I just hate it. I'm actually extremely mindful of, you know, getting good shots, getting the, the detail shots, um, I've been, uh, I've had a second shooter, uh, take off some of the load at, at a couple of the weddings, but I mean, I absolutely hate bridezillas. <laughs> like I, I, I'm so bad at putting up with shit <clears throat> and most of my friends, most of the ones that have asked me are some of the most laid back, chill, whatever is clever type of people. Uh, and they just, they let me be me. They, they let me capture their wedding uh, in a very creative and stylistic way. Um, and I think that that's probably the biggest difference is that I had a lot of freedom and I wasn't restricted to what, you know, the brides uh, demanded the entire session. So it, nine times out of 10, I always go to the bride and I'll just go like, is there any shot or shots, excuse me, uh, that I absolutely positively have to get to make you happy. And they'll tell me, you know, this is generally during uh, like a consultation, I'll just go, which shots do we need to make sure that you are 100% happy? We get those and then I fill in all the blanks. <clears throat> because a lot of times they don't think about the detail shots, they don't think about all the the, the little uh, accoutrement style shots and Oh, it's just so much better working with someone that knows you, knows how you shoot, knows what your creative style is, and basically gives you some level of um, artistic license. When it is so rigid and you have to coordinate with a videographer and a DJ and all this other kind of stuff, I mean, it's just brutal. Uh, I would rather take a bullet in the brain for real than, than do weddings. I, I don't know how wedding photographers do it day in and day out. Thank God there's a wedding season and then it ends at some point. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that's just, it's just not my, my cup of tea. Now I would, I would do second shooting probably on a more regular basis if I liked weddings more, but I just do not like them well enough to do them on a regular basis. I don't care what they pay. Um, I do like, and that's, that's essentially, I do a lot of photojournalism style uh, wedding photography. Um, that's a lot of what I do. I, I'm sort of just like capturing those little candid moments. Um, you know, the, those sweet little kisses from, you know, from mother to daughter or from son uh, in the handshake with the, with the dad. Um, the photojournalistic style of, uh, of photography for me uh, is probably the best uh, because it, 
nothing's posed. I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of posed photography either. I enjoy capturing candid moments, uh, real moments, interactions between two people or a real interaction between oneself. Um, and I think that the more posed that they are, it, yeah, I mean, it feels fake, so it feels like, uh, I don't know, it just feels dirty to me for some reason. I don't know. But that's just the artist in me. That's, that's not necessarily the photographer uh, talking. That's the artist in me. The, the photographer says, dude, just do whatever they ask you to. You got to make that money, right? So, uh, Danny Monster says, uh, best bit of photographer gear, uh, photography gear that I ever uh, bought was a pack pony. Uh, I can take every bit of kit I own, you know, just in case. <laughs> the other benefit is if I have, uh, if I haven't had to mow my lawn for months either. Yeah, it's true. Uh, they do come in handy. You should maybe just look into getting yourself maybe like a billy goat, a little bit smaller, same great yard maintenance qualities. Something like that. <laughs> All right, guys. I honestly have no idea how long I've been on, but I'm going to go ahead and hop off here. So I want every one of you guys to enjoy your Friday night. If you guys happen to be doing a little partying, think of me. Take a shot. And um, please don't forget to thumbs up this video and um, leave a comment or something. That would be nice. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. If, if Eric Marks ends up wanting to do a live show later on tonight. Um, I'm actually staying in tonight, so he and I might do another live stream later on his channel. So if you guys have not subscribed to his channel yet, I highly recommend, especially if you're into Fuji cameras or Fuji gear or Nikon, he's still a Nikon shooter too. Uh, just do a, a YouTube search for Finding Middle Earth or Eric Marks, E-R-I-C-M-A-R-K-S, Eric Marks. And uh, yeah. Totally subscribe. All right, guys. I'm out. Peace.